Hi, I'm John Post. Today I want to teach you a little bit how to make a, uh, your first glaze. And uh, in order to make a glaze, you need to have some supplies on hand, some tools. So let me give you a little introduction um, to those tools and what they're used for. Uh, one of the first things that you'll need is you'll need to have a glaze recipe. And so you can find these in uh, a lot of ceramics magazines. There's also books at your library that are full of glaze recipes. And you want to make sure that you've got a glaze recipe that uh, matches the temperature that you plan to fire it at. So if you normally fire at cone 6, you're going to want to look for cone 6 recipes. That's a good place to start. Um, another tool that you'll need is a scale of some sort. This happens to be a scientific scale. It's an Hull House triple beam scale. Uh, it's got a stainless steel pan on it to hold the glazed materials in it when you're weighing them out. Um, this thing is a, probably a little over a hundred bucks if uh, you buy it online or look through some scientific catalogs. Uh, another thing that I like to have is uh, measuring containers for water. Uh, I like to have these so that they measure in milliliters and the reason for that is that um, I use one milliliter of water for every one gram of glaze ingredient that I'm weighing out and this is a convenient way uh, to measure that water. You'll need a couple of mixing containers. These are just simply containers that are used um, for storing things in the freezer. Um, and so I purchased these at the grocery store. A couple of other things I like are called sieves. And what a sieve does is it's a screen inside of a little plastic cup. These are called test sieves. And what they do is they screen the dried material and letting you break it down so you get a nice homogeneous mix. And so I have them in two different mesh sizes. This one that says 60 mesh on it um, is got 60 holes per inch. And so that is a more coarse mesh than this other one, which is 100 mesh, and that has 100 holes per inch. So this is a finer screen. And so when we're screening the materials, I usually use the 60 mesh first. And then if um, that doesn't break down all the little materials, then I switch over to the 100 mesh. Another very useful tool is called a Jiffy Mixer. And this is like a paint mixer, but it's designed not to eat up the containers that you have the um, glazes in. And this just gets inserted into an electric drill. And this is the smallest size that they make, I believe. It's um, for stirring up pint sizes. I also have a larger one for bigger batches. And then um, another tool you'll need is a spatula of some sort. And what that's used for is for wiping the uh, glaze, pushing the glaze through the sieve. Um, when it comes to glaze recipes, I, I do have some preferences for my glazes. I like to have glaze recipes that have uh, at least 10% uh, clay or more in it. And the reason for that is that it keeps the glaze suspended in the bucket as a nice slurry. The slurry is the mix of glaze once you have it all mixed together. And glazes that have a very low percentage of clay in them tend to settle out at the bottom of the bucket. So if you're looking for a glaze to start with, I would sh suggest shooting for something that has a, a higher percentage of clay in it. So that brings us to the next part of this where we talk a little bit about um, what, the, what these things are that go into glazes. As I tell my elementary students, a glaze is just uh, rocks that are crushed from the earth and into very fine powders. And so when you see a glaze recipe, what you've got is uh, a list of different rocks that have been mined out of the earth and have been smashed down into very po fine powders, almost like flour. And there are three main uh, types of things that are in a glaze. And so the first one is, uh, is the melter. It's what melts the glaze and we call those things fluxes. So anything that helps the glaze to melt is considered a flux. There's also um, glass in a glaze. And so what the glass does is the glass helps to turn the, that glaze into glass. And then there's also clay in a glaze. And what the clay does is the clay keeps the fluxes and the glass from running entirely off of our clay piece. So what a glaze recipe is, is it's a mix of melters, glass, and clay and in various combinations that will either give us satin glazes or, or shiny glossy glazes or matte glazes 
And so when you look for a recipe, you won't know what that recipe is unless you look at its description. And it might give you a little hint of what that recipe is going to look like, whether it's shiny or matte or glossy or semi-matte or satin matte. All those are descriptions of glazes. In this video, what we're going to be making is a test glaze. Uh, artists typically don't go out and make a five-gallon bucket of a glaze recipe that they saw in a magazine. If you do that, there's a, there's a big chance that it might not work out. It might not look exactly the way that it looks in the magazine, and then you've wasted all those materials. So what you do is you make a small batch of it, test it on a small piece of clay, and fire it in your kiln. And then if it works out, you can scale everything up. So what I typically use for a test batch is a 400 gram batch. When you look up a glaze recipe in a magazine or a book, glaze recipes are typically written so that a portion of the glaze recipe adds up to 100 grams. This is called the, the um, base recipe. And then there's a little section below it sometimes that will have, it's called colorants. And it will be things that are added to that base recipe to give the glaze color or to opacify the glaze or to change it in some way. And so, um, since the glaze recipe adds up to 100 and I would like to make a 400 gram batch, that means that I need to multiply all those numbers in the 100 gram batch by 4. And so, let me talk a little bit about the glaze recipe that I have. The glaze recipe that I'm going to try today is one called butterscotch and it's got some ingredients in it and I'll go through the list and tell you what those things do for the glaze and then um, I'll show you the procedure for mixing it up. Um, in butterscotch there's an ingredient called nepheline cyanide and um, I told you earlier that, that there are three types of components in a glaze. That there are fluxes which are the melters, there's the glass former also known as flint or silica, and there's clay. Well, in Mother Nature, it's, it's very rare that we come across an ingredient that is just one of those. The rocks that we pulverize and grind up to make clay, clay ingredients, they usually contain a mix of all three. So, um, nepheline cyanide is typically seen as a melter, but it does have some components to it that form glass and some components to it that are clay. So, nepheline cyanide contains all three things, but because it's a powerful melter, we um, think of it as a melter. So, and it's called a feldspar. And so, it's, um, so nepheline cyanide is a, is a strong soda kind of feldspar material. Uh, the next ingredient in this glaze recipe is whiting. And so, whiting is also known as calcium carbonate, and you can think of this as chalkboard chalk. Whiting is another melter that's in this butterscotch glaze recipe. Um, this glaze recipe also has something in it called Gersley borate. It comes from a mine in California, and that's a very strong flux. It has some other things in it, some trace materials. It's also partly a glass former, um, and it also helps the slurry to stay suspended in the bucket. And so that's in this recipe as well. Um, in terms of clay for this butterscotch recipe, it's got 18.9% of something called EPK. EPK stands for Edgar Plastic, Plastic Kaolin, and that's a kaolin that comes from the southern part of the United States. I believe it's either Georgia or Florida, and it's a very white looking clay, and so you'll find it in a lot of recipes. If you have a glaze recipe that calls for kaolin, you can probably use Edgar Plastic Kaolin or EPK for that. Um, there are a couple other clays that you'll run across frequently in glazes. Um, one of them is called ball clay or Kentucky OM4. That's a clay that is a, um, not as white as EPK, but it's a little more sticky, and so you'll see that in some glaze recipes. And um, another clay that's kind of a volcanic clay is called bentonite, and potters will put that into a glaze if they don't think the slurry is behaving well enough in the bucket. You might see a glaze that has 2% bentonite in it, and what that does is that helps the other materials in the glaze to float a little better in that bucket. It helps them kind of all stick together. And so those are typically the three clays that you'll see the most when you're looking through glaze recipes. Um, this glaze recipe also has flint in it at close to 30%. And um, this is a glass former. So this is one of the materials that is, doesn't have any fluxes or clays in it. It's just glass. And so that's in this recipe. And so those um, five ingredients add up to the 100% base recipe. Then um, for colorants, this recipe has something in it called super packs. And what that is, is that's an opacifier. 
and so that material uh, makes the glaze uh, opaque. And then there's something called rutile in it, and rutile is a colorant, and so it also gives the glaze a little bit of visual texture, and so that rutile is in here at 5.8%. So those are the basic ingredients in this glaze that we're going to be weighing and mixing up uh, to make the test batch. Because I'm making a 400 gram batch of glaze, I want to use one milliliter of water for every gram of dry glaze ingredients. One milliliter of water happens to weigh one gram. And so what's going to happen here is that we're going to end up with an equal amount by weight of water and dry materials in the test glaze. So I just fill up this milliliter container to the 400 mark and then I transfer that to a container that I will add the dry glaze ingredients into. When I'm doing this I don't worry about the additions to the glaze, um, the, the colorants. I just worry about what the size of the base glaze is. The next part of this process is setting up the scale and in order to do that the scale needs to be zeroed out and so the way that you do this is you push all of the little sliders to zero and this is a um, balance beam and what you want to have is you want to have it read zero before you start weighing out your ingredients. Um, this balance beam has a fourth beam on the back here and it's got a little slider on it that I can slide forward and backwards to make this read zero and what that um, fourth beam does is it accounts for the weight of the pan. If you're using a digital scale all you have to do to take care of this is press a tear button after you put your pan on and that will make your scale read zero. The first ingredient that's going into this glaze is uh, going to be the clay and it doesn't matter to me what order the those things are written in when you see the glaze recipe I'll always look for the clay and add that first. So the clay in this happens to be EPK at 18.9% because I'm making a 400 gram batch, I need to have 4 times 18.9, which equals 75.6. So I'm going to move the tens slider on the scale over to the 70 position. The ones slider, I'm going to move it over to the 5. And then there's little tenth increments that come after, so I'm going to move it over to the sixth one of those. So this is right now is set up for 75.6. Then I'm going to take um, a scoop and get some EPK. So right now I'm going to add the EPK to the pan, just tapping with my finger. 75.6 isn't a lot of this. And so if you've gone over like I just did, you just scoop some out. Do a little tapping on the scoop and bring it up until the scale once again reads zero. So now I've got 75.6 grams in there and then I can take that and add it to my container that I'm going to be mixing all of these in. Like I said I like to do the clay first because I believe that this helps to keep the other ingredients from sinking to the bottom when I'm making the glaze. And the last thing I want to have is a hard pan, a bunch of really hard materials at the bottom. So by adding the clay first, I think that I avoid that. So once I've got the, the clay into the bucket, then I'll take my Jiffy mixer and give it a little blast. And so then the process is the same for adding the rest of the dry materials to the glaze. Unmistakable evidence has established the fact.
once you've got all the ingredients into your container, you can see that um, right here, you can even see how they've sunk to different levels. They're not uh, all well mixed together. So that's what the Jiffy Mixer is for. So I'm going to stir all of these glazed ingredients together. And even though I've stirred them with the Jiffy Mixer, some of these materials like to clump together. And so I'm going to take one of the sieves and I like to start with the 60 mesh because it has the larger um, openings in, in the screen. And so I'm just going to pour this through the 60 mesh sieve and use my spatula to get any of the the material that's left in the container. So this glaze went through that sieve very easily. I, I didn't require a lot of effort and work to get it through here. And so this one is a pretty well behaved glaze and um, very easy to work with. Um, sometimes I'll pour it through a couple of times. Uh, there are some materials that just are, are coarse and bumpy. A couple of the ones in my studio that don't go too well through the sieve are titanium dioxide and tin oxide. And for those, not only will I run it through the 60 mesh screen, I'll run it through the 100 mesh. And so, like I said, normally that 60 mesh would be enough for this butterscotch glaze, but just for demonstration purposes, I'll, I'll run it through the 100 mesh. And this is pouring pretty well through here as well. It just is going right through there without much effort. The spatula, is where you push it through if the glaze has some coarse materials in it that aren't finding their way through the sieve quickly and easily. So that's what these sieves are for, is to help push the materials through and to make, make it so that when you've got a container of test glaze, you've got a nice homogeneous mix. All of the materials are suspended in the slurry. And so that's where we're at right now with this little bucket. Once you've got your test batch made, the next thing to do is to get this glaze onto some clay pieces so that you can fire it in your kiln and see what it looks like. Some potters make small little flat tiles. Uh, this one has a white slip over a brown clay. This lets me see what this glaze looks like on two different types of clay surfaces. This is a T test tile and I just make these with my extruder. I cut out a die for this. And so uh, this lets me see what this looks like on an upright piece of clay. This is similar to the T, except that it's designed so that I can break the bottom part of this die off. And that would make this die easier to store and you can fit more of them into a box. So that's one way to, to maximize some savings in terms of space when it comes to test tiles. You can make little pots, and uh, this is why I like to use a 400 gram batch. I can take this butterscotch and pour it over this pot and uh, get a little more representative sample of what this glaze is going to look like. Another thing that I like to make is just little juice tumblers, and uh, then I can test the glaze on the inside and on the exterior surface and see what it looks like, see how it breaks over edges. So all of those things work as test tiles. Um, in order to know what glazes you have in, in the firing, it's good to be able to mark your test tiles uh, in a way that you can refer to those markings later and see which glaze you used. What I like to use is uh, red iron oxide, and so I take just a little butter container, take a scoop of red iron oxide, add it to the container, you don't need much. And then what I like to do after that is add some water to this and then stir this up and this makes a marking fluid and so on tiles that don't have too much iron in them this is a pretty good marking fluid and so I can just take this um, tile and I can write the glaze name on the bottom and so for this I'm just going to write 
um, butterscotch because that's the name of this glaze. Now, if I made some changes to this glaze, I might just put a number after it. Like this is butterscotch two, a second variation where I tried to tweak it or change something. If I added different colorants, I might write what that colorant percentage was on the bottom. So if I added cobalt or something else to this glaze to change its nature, I'd write those on the bottom as notes to myself in the future. Um, if you're working on dark clay, some artists like to take and add just a little bit of cobalt carbonate. And um, this is a, a colorant that will make this marking fluid turn a darker black. But um, I don't need to do that on my clay, so I'm not going to do that here. When it comes to dipping test tiles, I like to um, get several dips on one. And so what I'll do is I will dip this in and count to two in my head, and pull it out. And so that's my first dip on this test tile. This will be the thinnest that this glaze is. And so if I'm doing these two tiles, now they have a, a two second dip. If I take that same tile and dip it for another two seconds, a little, but leave some of it out. Now up to this line, um, everything from the top of the tile to here is a four second dip and the bottom is a two second dip. So this is so I can see different thicknesses of this glaze. And so by doing this again for about two seconds, I get different thicknesses. And then lastly, I can go in and do one more two second dip. And so now the bottom of this tile will have the thinnest glaze, the top of it will have the thickest glaze, and it lets me see how this glaze reacts when applied in different thicknesses. And so um, mark the bottom of those and uh, get them ready for a firing and then you'll be able to see what your glaze looks like. I fired the butterscotch glaze on some small test pots along with a load of my other work and the results were a little surprising. I was expecting a caramel colored glaze, uh, something in the butterscotch family. Uh, what I got was a satin eggshell white. The butterscotch is on the lower portion of this pot. And it's a very nice eggshell white, but it isn't, doesn't look like butterscotch at all to me. And the reason that I think that happened is that the colorants in this, the rutile, the rutile that I used was a very light rutile. And I don't think that it had enough iron in it to turn this glaze into a butterscotch color. So that's my next test, is to take some red iron oxide and add it to this butterscotch glaze and see if this changes and alters the color of this into more of a butterscotch color because the surface of this glaze is really quite nice. I hope this video took a little bit of the mystery out of going from a glaze recipe that you find in a book or magazine to actually making it. Um, at its simplest, glazes are just a bunch of rocks that have been dug out of the earth and they are pulverized, turned into powders, that potters and artists can then add to water in different amounts to make different glazes for their work. Uh, the process of testing a glaze is important before you commit to a big batch if you're new to this, and so that's what I recommend doing. The other thing that you may have noticed is that I was not wearing a respirator in this video, and that's because I was making a video and it was a little cumbersome to go back and forth between doing that. But when I make my own glazes, I am wearing a respirator, and you should too. Protect your lungs. I hope you found this information useful, and uh, I hope that you try making some glazes for yourself. I know that it's uh, very economical compared to buying those small pints of glazes at $18 to $25 each. When I work with my students, I can make a full five-gallon bucket of glaze for that same price of a pint, and it really stretches the dollar in my art program. Thanks for watching. I'll see you next time.